Welcome to Love Worth Finding with pastor, teacher, and author Adrian Rogers, reaching out with God's love, bringing people to Christ, touching lives around the world, and helping you find the answers you need today. Join us as we prepare to open God's Word and discover how your life can be changed forever by His great love worth finding. Would you take God's precious Word and turn to first, or Second Peter, rather, chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, and while you're turning, look up here. And uh, Mark Twain was told by somebody, I'm afraid that the world is coming to an end. He just smiled and said, that's okay, we can get along without it. <laughs> the truth of the matter is we can because there is a brand new world coming. There will be a new birth for planet Earth, and the Bible tells us about it here in this uh, passage of Scripture. And how's this uh, uh, new world going to be brought about? Well, it's not going to be brought about by the intellectuals, the uh, top waters of this world, the high muckety-mucks are not going to bring it about. And no matter how much we try and how many politicians huddle behind closed doors, or how many people move on battlefields, they're not going to bring about the new world or what they call a new world order. Why? Because a wise man said a long time ago, you can't make a good omelet out of bad eggs, <laughs> no matter how much you stir them. How is this new world uh, going to come about? Well, we're going to find out as we look into God's Word. Now, you're in 2 Peter. There are three worlds that are mentioned here, and I want you to see. Look, for example, uh, in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 6. Notice what it says. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Now, that's the past world, the world that then was. And then look, if you will, in verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store. Now, there's the world that was, and there's the world that is now. And then look, if you will, please, in verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Do you see it? Three worlds, the past world, the present world, and the prospective world. And we're going to think about those three worlds. And this passage here in 2 Peter tells us that there are new heavens and a new earth coming our way. Now, let's look at these three worlds if we can. That, the past world was destroyed by flood. The past world was destroyed by flood. Look, if you will, now in verse 5. Uh, well, let's go to verse 4. Well, let's back up and go to verse 3. Uh, knowing this first, that there should come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of His coming? <laughs> there are going to be people wagging their tongues and saying, you preachers, always talking about the second coming of Jesus. Uh, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Now, the past world was destroyed by a flood. And the passage that I just read to you tells us several things about that past world. Number one, it was a created world. Look again in verse 5. By the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. What does that mean? It means that God spoke and it came into existence. <laughs> How did this world come into existence? How did the universe spring forth? Not by some big bang, <laughs> but by the word of God. The book of Hebrews says the heavens were, were framed by the word of God. So that's so very important. Because if you're wrong about the origin of the world, you're going to be wrong about its destiny. If you deny the past, you're going to distort the present. If you don't understand how it came to being, you're not going to understand how it's going to wrap up. You know, the key to the whole Bible really is Genesis 1-1, isn't it? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I believe in creation. By the way, the founding fathers of this nation believed in creation. Did you know that? <laughs> uh, we owe these truths be self-evident. We don't even quibble about this, that all men are uh, 
ordained by their Creator with certain uh, inalienable rights. Uh, the, these rights are given by our Creator. It's, a, it's amazing amazement to me that we can't even teach creation in the public schools. That past world, verse 5 tells us, it was a created world. How else did it come to pass? Do you believe that nothing's time, nothing times nobody equals everything? Do you believe that? I don't. Uh, God spoke and it was so, but not only was it a created world, it was a corrupted world. The Bible says the world that then was perished. Why? Because you go back to Genesis chapter uh, 6 and you find out that the earth was filled with violence and, uh, and God said, I'm going to destroy the world. Well, we live in a world today that is filled with violence. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be. Now, the people in Noah's day, according to Jesus, uh, were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day the flood came. That is, they were going, this, this created world uh, became a corrupted world and they were just uh, eating and drinking, going about just like we will do today. I mean, most of us don't have any idea that judgment may come today. They didn't in Noah's day. <laughs> uh, somebody said the basic problem in our society is indifference. But who cares? <laughs> who cares? That's the way they were in Noah's day. It was a created world. It was a corrupted world, and therefore it was a condemned world. Verse 6 says, it perished. It perished. God waited in the days of Noah. Uh, the Bible tells us over there in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, it speaks of those which were sometime disobedient when the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. The long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. Noah preached for 120 years with the wrath of God in the foreground, the ring of hammers in the background. Noah preached for 120 years. This scripture tells us that God was long-suffering. Have you ever thought about the man Methuselah? Bible trivia. Who lived longer than any other man ever lived? What's his name? Methuselah. How long did he live? 969 years, longer than any other man. Why did Methuselah live so long? Why is that put in the Bible? Do you know what the name Methuselah means? By the way, I've, I've, uh, I've dedicated a lot of babies. I've yet to dedicate a Methuselah. <laughs> I've dedicated an Aaron and a, and, and a, a Peter and a John and, and even a Moses, but never a Methuselah. Do you know what Methuselah means? The name Methuselah was a sign that God gave and Methuselah means when he is dead or when he is gone, it will come. That's what it means. When he is dead, it will come. Speaking of the flood, <laughs> his, his father, uh, Enoch, imagine every time Methuselah got a cold, he said, now, you all right, son? <laughs> Take care of yourself, son. Uh, when he is gone, it will come. I can show you from the Bible. No ifs, ands, buts, stutter about it. I can show you that the flood came when Methuselah died. And that's the reason Methuselah lived to be 969 years because God was long-suffering, wanting more and more people to be saved, wanting more and more people to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there was the judgment of God. Men were living so wickedly, and God was about to bring judgment. But he said, I'm going to, I'm going to hold off. Maybe another person will come. I'm going to hold off. Maybe another person will come. And the Bible calls that the long-suffering of God. I believe we're living in a day where there's the long-suffering of God, don't you? I believe that this world is ripe for judgment. In Noah's day, the raging waters of God's wrath were furiously pounding against the dam of His mercy. One day, the dam of God's mercy will give way to the waters of God's wrath. The world that then was, that past world, it was a created world, it was a corrupted world. It was a condemned world. That's the past world, the world that then was. But now let's look at the world that is right now. The world that then was was destroyed by flood. The world that now is, the present world, is destined for fire. It is destined for fire. 
Look, if you will, in, in uh, verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, that's our world right now, by the same word, the same word that uh, created the first world, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire. Underscore that. I've underscored it in my Bible. Reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. And then Peter describes it further at verses 10 and 11. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And then Peter asked this pregnant question, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Now go back to look at that word in verse 7, reserved unto fire. Kenneth Woost, his name is spelled W-E-S-T, is a great Greek scholar. I, I wanted to see what uh, Kenneth Woost would say about this. Kenneth Wu said that that word reserved unto fire is actually in the Greek, maybe translated, it is stored with fire. Stored with fire. This world in which we live is stored, it is crammed with fire. Now, we live in the nuclear age. And scientists of our day and age have determined that there is an atomic structure to everything. And in this particle of matter, if we can call it matter, that we call the atom, there is a nucleus. That nucleus has a very dense center, and it has a, a positive electrical charge in the nucleus of the atom. Now, around that nucleus are molecular particles uh, that uh, whirl around that nucleus. And those minute uh, particles are called electrons. And they have a negative charge. And they whirl around the center, the nucleus of that atom, at incredible speeds. <laughs> they, they, they whirl around there billions of times every millionth of a second. That's pretty fast. If you go billions of times every millionth of a second, I mean, it's, it's unthinkable speed. And they're just whirling around this nucleus. Now, the nucleus has a positive charge and the electrons have a negative charge. And the positive and the negative, they attract one another and that's what keeps it all together. That's what causes it to cohese. Now, the problem is nobody understands what that electrical charge is. Now, they can measure it mathematically, but they don't understand it. And they don't understand what gives this thing this incredible thrust that moves so fast. But that's, it, 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 it hangs together because the positive and the negative, they just attract one another. And in the, in the nucleus, there's what we call protons and neutrons. Now, the protons have, as we said, the positive charge. The neutrons are not positive or negative. They're neutral, neutrons. And so, what keeps these uh, protons from disintegrating? Because uh, two positive charges repel each other. How do they hang together? Especially when the uh, electrons are pulling this way, attracting, and the, uh, the protons are repelling. Point. What holds it all together. It's not a what, it's who. His name is Jesus. The Bible tells us in Colossians, by him all things consist. All matter is made up of atomic structure. Now, it's basically not solid. It's basically, everything is really just electrical charges. Uh, if you get down to the very elements of matter, it's, it's, it's power, not substance as we see it. As a matter of fact, uh, everything is not really solid. This is just a whirling mass of energy, this pulpit that I stand on. Now, the Word of God is very clear about this. As a matter of fact, 
Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3 says, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. We've already talked about that. So that things which are seen, this pulpit, are made out of things that don't appear. Molecular structure. Things that are seen are made out of things that don't appear. That is, the visible is made of the invisible. And what is the invisible? It is the nuclear structure of this world, and the Bible says it is stored with fire. Everything really is fire. I dress with fire. I breathe fire. I eat fire. I drink fire. I sleep on fire. I stand behind a pulpit of fire. I hold a Bible that is charged with fire. Everything that we have and are and feel and see, friend, is stored with fire. Now, I don't think Peter knew that, but I think God knew it when he told Peter what to write. And, and, and God says that we live in a world that is supercharged. It is stored with fire. Now, what's going to happen? Well, the Bible says the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. Look in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. <laughs> it didn't begin with a big bang. It's going to end with one. It's going to end with a big bang, with a great noise. And the elements, you know what the word element means? It means the basic entity of creation shall melt with fervent heat. You know what the word fervent is? It's a medical term. It means fever. Uh, these basic components of everything are going, they have this internal heat, this, this fever heat. And the Bible says it's going to melt with fervent heat. And the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. People used to scoff at that. You say, how's, how's dirt going to burn? How's air going to burn? How is water going to burn? They don't scoff at that anymore. Not since the hydrogen bomb and the neutron bomb or the other bombs. They don't, they don't scoff at that anymore. No, sir. Now, our scientists will tell us what the Word of God told us 2,000 years ago, that everything is stored with fire and, and it's, going to be, it's going to melt with fervent heat, internal heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now look in verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. Look at the word dissolved. It's the Greek word luo, which means loosed, <laughs> let go. It's the same word that John the Baptist used of the Lord Jesus when he said, I'm not worthy to unlatch his shoe like you untie your shoelaces. I'm I'm not worthy to do it. It's the same word that was used when Lazarus came out of that grave and they said, loose him and let him go. You know what's going to happen? This world's stored with fire. These, these electrons and, and protons are there together, bound up in that uh, atom, held by that cohesive force. One of these days, God's going to say, okay, that's it. Let it go. Unloose it. You talk about an atomic explosion, that's the big bang, my friend. That's when the elements will melt with fervent heat and this, this entire molecular structure of our world will come apart as it does. Now, it was water the first time. It will be fire the second time. Now, let's see how Peter describes our present world. In verse 3, he describes it as a scoffing world. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. Now, there are people who think that you and I are ready for uh, the happy farm. I, they, they, they believe that, uh, that we are crazy. They scoff at what we preach. They scoff at the idea of God. They scoff at the idea of a judgment. They scoff at the idea of the second coming of Jesus. There will come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? May I tell you that every scoffer himself is a sign of the coming of Jesus? He himself becomes a sign of the coming of Jesus because the Bible prophesied this scoffer would come. And I want to say to any of you who <laughs> might be going through the television channels and you pause for a while just to say what this nut 
We'll say. You can laugh your way into hell, but you can't laugh your way out once you get there. You can scoff if you wish. Our world is a scoffing world. And uh, the, the late night comedians and others get their jollies making fun of Bible-believing Christians and the second coming of Jesus Christ. But not only is it a scoffing world, it's, it's also a sinning world. Look again in verse 3, if you will. Scoffers walking after their own lust. May I tell you why people scoff? Because they're walking after their own lust. You show me a person who ridicules the Word of God, who ridicules the things of God, and I'll show you a person with the devil's initials carved in his heart. I'll show you a woman covered with the slimy fingerprints of sin. Every time you find a scoffer, you'll find somebody walking after his or her own lust. The present world, Peter says, is a scoffing world. It is a sinning world, and it is a sentenced world. This world is destined, friend, for fire, reserved unto fire, verse 7 says. So don't fall too much in love with this world. It has the sentence of death on it. Water the first time, fire the second time. But this world is destined for judgment. It is de destined for fire. So don't fall in love with it. If you do, you're like a cruise director for the Titanic. Now here's the third world I want you to see. We've talked about the past world. We've talked about the present world. Let's talk about the world to come, the prospective world. The prospective world is designed for glory. 2 Peter 3, begin in verse 12, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the Son of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens, and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now, this prospective world is not going to be destroyed by fire and not by water, not by flood, not by fire. This world is a world of forever. The Bible says that Abraham looked for a city that had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. David said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. May I give you three marks of the prospective world, the future world, the world to come? Number one, it is a world that has been promised. Look, if you will, in verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. Adrian, how can you be so sure? Because God has promised. God has promised. God has never broken a promise. All the promises in the Bible are yea and amen in the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, let me tell you something. If God were ever to be slack concerning a promise or go back on a promise, do you know what that promise would be? Of course, he can't and he will not. But it, if he ever would be tempted not to keep a promise, it would be the one to send Jesus to die on the cross. If he kept that one, you can be sure he'll keep all the rest. I mean, if he kept that one. The Bible says in Romans 8, He that spared not his own son, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? All the promises of God are yea and amen in the Lord Jesus Christ. This world is a promise world. That's the reason Peter says in verse 9 of this same chapter, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. Don't think because it's been 2,000 years that Jesus is not coming. I'm telling you, it's only the long suffering of God. God is waiting for you, sir, and you, young man, and you, sweet girl, to be saved. That's why. The, the Lord hasn't forgotten the promise. The Lord is saying, one more soul, one more person. But he says, one of these days, the day of the Lord will come. Judgment will come. Who knows? Who knows? But what, the last soul will be saved in this service 
before Jesus steps out of the glory. And we go home to meet him. And we enter into the great tribulation. And those awful end time events take place before this world is turned to a cinder. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. One of these days, uh, it, he's going to come. The Lord is waiting as he did in the days of Methuselah. Long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. God wants you to be saved, and I would be saved if I were you, before I left this building. I really would. Now, this world, this, this, this coming world, it's a promised world, according to his promise. And also, it's a purified world. Look in verse 13. Uh, we look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwells righteousness. Do you see that? What's wrong with the world today? Sin. Now, can you imagine anybody standing up in the university, uh, great universities of our world today and saying, oh, ladies and gentlemen, the problem is sin. Can you imagine anybody uh, in uh, the closed doors of, of Congress or uh, somebody standing up and saying, well, let me tell you what the problem is. The problem is sin. People don't want to be told the problem is sin. I mean, they think somehow education is the answer, not if the problem is sin. Now, you take an ignorant man, he'll steal a watermelon off a boxcar, give him an education, he'll steal the railroad. Becomes a clever devil. Well, you say, uh, uh, technology can serve the, solve the world's problems. No, it can't. Technologically, we know more today than we've ever known, and we're more afraid today than we've ever been. Even afraid to open a letter. Afraid to fly on an airplane. We know it all, but friend, behind it all is what? Sin. It's coming a time when there's a world that sin will be out of bounds. No more sin. God says, I'm going to make new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth Righteousness. That means righteousness is at home. Therefore, you're not going to get into this new earth without a new birth. No way possible. The Bible says they shall not enter into it anything that defileth or worketh abomination or worketh a lie, but they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, uh, there's a world coming, but this coming world is not going to be uh, soiled by sin. Listen to these verses. Revelation 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. That's Revelation 21, 1. Now listen to verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. Is your name in the Lamb's book of life? I mean, if Jesus were to come today as a thief in the night, and all of these events were to set into motion, would you be ready to meet him? <laughs> I didn't ask are you a, a Baptist or Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Roman Catholic, Pentecostal, Charismatic, Orthodox. I'm asking, do you know Jesus? I'm asking, has the love of sin died in your heart? I'm not asking, are you perfect? None is perfect. But friend, I am telling you that when a person gives his or her heart to Jesus Christ, there is a divine change. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Amen. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. This new world is a promised world. God cannot lie. It is a purified world. It is a world wherein dwells righteousness. And I want to say it is a provided world. Look, if you will, again in verse 13. We, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. It's not going to be brought about by human plans. The answer to this world's problems is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And this new world, promised, purified, will be provided, and God himself will bring in a new age. And I'm not talking about the new age religion that we talk about today. God himself will bring about a one-world government, but not the foolish one-world government that this world is headed to that will be headed up by the Antichrist. Now, we've come to the close of the message. Let's see if we can apply it. Are you ready? Nod your head. Good. <laughs> All right. 
How then, if all of this is true, and we've seen the past world, the present world, and the prospective world, if all of this is true, notice how practical Peter is. Look now in 2 Peter 3, verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, now listen to this, wherefore, beloved, he's talking to you folks, listen, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found in him, of him, in peace, without spot, and blameless. Now, go up into the middle there. He says, what manner of persons ought ye to be? You see that in verse 11? You know what the word manner means? The word manner means exotic or out of this world. What he's saying is we, we've got to be different. We don't belong to this world. The word literally means from out of this world. What other worldly kind of person ought we to be? See, we're different from everybody else. A citizen is at home. A stranger is away from home. A pilgrim is headed home. We're pilgrims. This world is not our home, this present world. We're only passing through. We are not citizens of earth trying to get to heaven. Friend, we are citizens of heaven just dwelling here. This world is not your home. Don't settle down. One man said, Lord, if I'm building a nest, put a thorn in it. We're not of this world. See, listen, what I preach today is not a matter primarily of speculation or information, but motivation. Notice what Peter's saying. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what out of this world type of person ought you to be? What otherworldly person ought you to be? What, if you can use the word exotic person, ought you to be? You ought to be different. The truth as to whether or not you really believe what I preach today is, will it change your life? Seeing then that all these things should be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be? May I suggest three things will be true very quickly? Number one, you're going to live for his coming. In verse 11, he says, in all holy conversation. The word conversation there means manner of life. <laughs> we sang about holiness today. We sang holy, holy, holy. Baptists love to sing about it, but if you talk about it, they get nervous. Now, <laughs> Baptists want to be healthy. They want to be happy. They want to be wise. But you talk to uh, 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 people about holiness, and then they get nervous. But Peter says, if you believe that there's a new world coming, you're going to want to be holy. Very few people really want to be holy. Why? I mean, we think of holiness as weird. If you want to make fun of somebody, what do you call him? Holy Joe. You want to put somebody down? Holier than thou. If you want to ridicule somebody exuberant, holy roller. Isn't that right? The Bible says, be ye holy, for I'm holy. That's what God says. I mean, if you believe that there's a new world coming, this old world is destined for fire. What manner of person you ought to be? He says you ought to live for his coming. You ought to be holy. Number two, you should look for his coming. Look in verse 12. He says here, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. Are you looking for Jesus to come? Amen. You ought to. You ought to be living for his coming. You ought to be looking for his coming. By the way, there's some theologians who believe we're going through the great tribulation before uh, we're caught up to meet the Lord. I don't believe that. Uh, we're looking for his coming. We're looking for Jesus. We're not looking around. We're looking up. If the Bible teaches anything, it teaches that Jesus Christ may come at any moment. And you ought to be holy, living for his coming. You ought to be anticipating, looking for his coming. 
And friend, you ought to be longing for His coming. I can honestly say this, God being my witness, I long for Jesus to come. I want Him to come. My prayer is the closing prayer of the Bible, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Look, if you will, in verse 15, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. What does that mean? It literally means deliverance. One of these days, soon, perhaps, this afternoon at 329, maybe, <laughs> Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And His coming is going to be like a thief in the night. No thief ever says, dear friend, I'm coming Tuesday night at 1.30 a.m. He doesn't say that. Are you ready? You know the problem with us? Folks, we're so much in love with this present world. Isn't that true? Right. You know, I think sometimes God allows us to have heartaches and sorrows and pain and difficulty because we just love this old world so much. As a motivational speaker, his name is Charles Tremendous Jones. Some of you heard <laughs> Tremendous Jones speak. He's good. Charlie Jones said, I had in the basement of my house my study. And he said, I had all of the plaques and all of the letters of congratulation and all of the awards that I'd won. He said, I had the walls covered with them. All my treasure letters, all my memorabilia. You know how people just love to look at those things and think they're really important. And he said, I had all that stuff all over the walls of my study. And he said, we had a flood. And the water and the mud ran down and filled up my basement and ruined it all, all of my pretty things. And I began to cry to Jesus about it and tell him all the terrible things that had happened to my precious things. And he said, Jesus said to me, Oh, Charlie, don't worry about that stuff. I was going to burn it up anyway. <laughs> Isn't that true? I mean, all these things, friend, it is destined for fire. Jesus is coming. Amen. What manner of persons ought we to be if we really believe? It? We'll live for His coming, we'll look for it, and we'll long for it. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ and know that you know Him, would you begin to pray for those around about you who may not yet know Him? And if you are not certain that you're ready for Jesus to come, you can be certain today because He loves you. And verse 9 says, He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants you to be saved. And I believe that's part of the providential plan of God that you're here today you might receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Would you like to be saved? I'm not talking about just being a Baptist or Methodist or Presbyterian or even being a nicer person. I'm not about being saved. Would you really like to know that your destiny is secure, that you're going to dwell in the new heavens and the new earth because you've been saved? Would you pray a prayer like this and pray it silently but fervently? Oh, God, I am a sinner, and my sin deserves judgment, and I know it. But I need and I want mercy. Thank you, Lord, that you're not willing that I should perish. Thank you that you sent Jesus to pay for my sin on the cross. Thank you for such love and mercy. I repent of my sin. I'm sorry for my sin. I turn by faith, dear God, to you. I open my heart. I invite you into my life. I put you on the throne of my life. Take control of my life. Begin now to make me the person you want me to be. 
save me, Jesus. I receive it as a free gift right now. I'm weak. You'll have to work with me. But begin now to make me the person you want me to be. Save me, Jesus. And Lord Jesus, help me to love you enough that I'll not be ashamed of you. Give me the courage to make it public, Lord Jesus, not to be ashamed of you. In your name I pray. Amen. We pray God has blessed you as you've watched this message. If you'd like additional copies or information on other resources, write us at Love Worth Finding, P.O. Box 38800, Memphis, Tennessee, 38183. You can also visit our online bookstore at lwf.org. In the U.S., you can place Visa or MasterCard orders by calling 1-800-274-5683, Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Central Time. Thank you, and may God richly bless you.